I'm in an interesting exchange with a couple of people on the subject of whether or not we can determine that there are evil people out there. And I've currently thrown the idea out there that, okay, if there are evil people out there, then there must be good people, right? Um, uh, or I would presume so. Uh, because the same criteria that you can use to identify an evil person, you take the opposite of those and you can then identify a good person, right? But what's a good act? Well, you can spin any altruistic act negatively. It doesn't matter what somebody does. You can spin it in such a way that you can make it look bad. Now, one of my... Like you can just say that this person had an ulterior motive for their good acts. It's an easy dodge. It's the oldest game in the lawyer's book, right? Um, <clears throat> You can smear somebody by just putting a negative spin on everything that they do. Um, you see this in teasing competitions in high school among girls. You know, it's just, um, they're just as vicious as the boys, but they do it in a different way. The boys punch each other's lights out and blatantly bully each other. The girls sort of try and destroy each other's reputations or whispering campaigns and stuff like that. That all takes place. And it's basically just to spin the discourse to make every, you know, your opponent look horrible. Um, it's not that difficult to do. Uh, once you decide, and once you understand that, you know, this is a game that's being played, you, if you want to spin uh, a good person's act in a horrible way, it can be done if you're creative enough. You can say the person's egoistic, the person just is self-aggrandizing, they have a hidden agenda, um, they want to win a popularity contest, all this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, you've just taken apart altruism, it just doesn't exist anymore, there's no such thing. Um, okay, then the same thing is for evil people, right? You can sort of say this guy did all these horrible things, like, uh, you know, take a ridiculous example. What if Hitler meant well, you know? Um, you want to have that argument? You could do it. You're going to shock a lot of people. But, you know, do you want to go down that rabbit hole? Um, what if Hitler sincerely believed that the human race would be better off if he won the Second World War and implemented his grand plan for the conquest of Europe and its enslavement by Germany? Everybody was going to be better off as a result of that, or the human race would have been improved if this happens, because we, if we're the best people, we're in charge of everything, we just tell everybody what to do, and we know who the good and the bad people are, and we promote the good people, and we delete the bad people. There, that's what the world needs, right? Um, you know, there, see how easy it is to do that if you want to? If you're crazy enough to <laughs> sort of get into that kind of thing? Uh, talk about somebody who wants to quote mine me to destroy me, then, well, there, I've just given you great ammunition, <laughs> you know. Um, <clears throat> And, and I'm not saying that, that like, what, what I'm saying is there's no, no one person that's very simple that you can just say that this person is bad. Uh, the old one sort of said, well, you're, you're willing to admit that the common person is sadistic. Uh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Not fundamentally sadistic, I, as in that's the defining aspect of what they are. Um, I would say that it's all, it's in all of us. Um, Neoskeptic said, well, how would you feel if something horrible happened to a member of your family. I, and I retorted, okay, I could hardly be expected to act in the same manner because we can say that I've been pushed beyond my limits. Um, which, what's the real me? Is the real me the person that's just gone through something absolutely insanely shocking and soul crushing? Or is the real me what you see right now when everything is going reasonably well in my life? Who decides what's the real me? They say, well, your real person comes out when there's a crisis going on. Is that your real person? Or is that just part of you that you've buried and it's now coming to the fore? It's just as real as the other part of your character. It, the, the one doesn't necessarily have to be the one that defines you as a good or an evil person. Um, there's a couple of interesting stories that I've, you know, little vignettes. I like this kind of thing. These little things make me think. Um, there was, a, I think it was... 
Saint-Exupéry, the guy who wrote Le Petit Prince in France, um, he wrote about an experience in the Spanish Civil War, like a horribly brutal war, where everybody basically lost their cool at everybody else, and hatred just sort of t seemed to take over Spanish society. Look at the polarization that's taking place now in America, and the partisan madness that's going on now, uh, that's allegedly ripping in America's guts out. <clears throat> also, I guess, you know, in the UK, the same thing is similarly seeming to happen over Brexit or whatever. Um, is it really that bad? But, you know, multiply that by 10 and you've got the Spanish Civil War. You've got extreme hatreds. Now, there was this one guy, I forget if I'm really ac relaying it accurately, but I, I can give you the spirit of it. This, this guy was in prison after the Spanish Civil War, after the nationalists, the fascists, or whatever you want to call them, the monarchists, overran a Republican town, and he was in jail. He was a communist or an anarchist or a socialist or something like this. He was fighting for the Republic. And he's in prison, and he's about to be shot, or he thinks he's about to be shot. Or, you know, he was, he was about to be, something bad was about to happen to him. And <clears throat> his warder came in to sort of get him out of his cell. And the guy who was condemned um, just sort of thought about it and assessed his life and went, yeah, this is pretty crazy, the situation that I've landed myself in in life. Isn't life kind of absurd? Here I am. I'm going to go off and face a firing squad now. This is, when you think about it, what a crazy way to end your life. I mean, you know. Here I am, a French citizen, fighting in a war in Spain on the left, fighting against fascism. And my side lost, and now I'm going to go off and get shot. Oh, well. Like, what can I do in a circumstance like this? Hell with it. You know, I'm going to try and at least die happy. I'm just going to sort of, you know, try and see, um, you know, I'm going to try and enjoy my last few moments here. You know, what the heck? Why not? Death is coming. It's inevitable. Whatever. Why, why fear the inevitable? So the warder came out to get him out of jail, looked at him, and then the guy, the French guy, I think it was Saint-Exupéry, was in prison. And he sort of looks at the warder and sort of gives him an ironic sort of wry smile. Uh, you know, it's like, okay, let's get this over with. with I'm the guy that you're going to shoot. There. <laughs> you know, we're in an absurd comedy here, and I'm going to get shot. <laughs> well, I'm not going to cause any trouble. I, I don't feel like spending my last days raging against anything or being angry at anybody or my last minutes. I'm going to die with a smile on my face, you know. Fuck it. <laughs> um, and didn't his warder pick up on that? His warder sort of understood in some strange way, or at least that's the way the story is told, that this isn't a communist or a socialist peering at me through the bars. This is a guy that recognizes the madness of human drama. And he sort of accepts his fate. He accepts whatever happens to him. And he's going to be shot. And he says, well, <laughs> I'm going to be shot. Whatever. Um, <clears throat> and I guess, in some sense, that convinced the warder to intervene with his officer to say, look, don't shoot this guy. For some reason, you know, they... they the Spanish term, you know, you're a bon, he's a bon chico, he's a good, good guy, you know, you know, maybe he's a, he's a communist or whatever, but, you know, are you going to say that our cause is morally impeccable when we, what we had to do with whatever, you know, it's not, um, <clears throat> it's not that he was saying it's okay to be a communist, but he's sort of saying in spite of the fact that he's a communist, the guy's not a bad fellow. <clears throat> now that's crazy that this should take place as a result of a smile where somebody read the other guy's psychology perfectly. Um, you know, it's the stuff of short stories, right? When this happens, you know, the guy, the, the, was, the guy who was supposed to be shot just had no more resentment left in him, just no more desire to fight. Uh, he was probably willing to go off and fight and kill fascists and everything like that. But now, due to outside influences, with events beyond his control, he's now in prison and he's facing a firing squad. Isn't life absurd? You know, if I've got five minutes left to live, I'm going to enjoy these five minutes. I'm going to walk around breathing the air and sort of, you know, thinking, okay, this is my last few minutes. And allegedly his warder could read that. 
that action doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit into the overall narrative of what the Spanish Civil War was. It was a war that was full of atrocity. It was full of visceral, severe hatreds. As I say, take Trump's America and multiply that polarization by 10, 100, whatever, and you'll, you'll get Spain during the Civil War. It was just, they say Civil Wars are the most brutal, hateful wars because you go to war with people that you know. Um, and, you know, in the midst of this absolute wretched, hateful situation, um, humanity just ping, out of nowhere appeared because somebody just, it wasn't even taking a chance. They sort of believed that they saw this situation for what it was. We both put aside for a moment the fact that we're on opposite sides in the civil war, that we really, if we were on opposite sides of a barricade, we'd gladly shoot each other in the face. But now that we're meeting on human terms, you know, you're not afraid of me anymore because I'm going to shoot you. It's a, I've become necessity. I've become inevitability. You're just sort of accepting your fate in a kind of humorous sort of way. Like, isn't life absurd? I'm about to be shot. <laughs> you know, I lived all my life. I was a child playing in my playground when I was a kid. I knew all these people in my life. I did all these wonderful things and these terrible things and experienced so much. And it, at the end of it all, I just get stood up against a wall, shot. <laughs> Ridiculous. And again, some sort of connection took place. Now, how do you, how do you fit that into the overall narrative? How do you fit that act into what's going on? Um, a lot of people say that the Spanish mind can do that, that, you know, you can, your emotions can turn on a dime like that. A lot of people who, like, I've been to Latin America, and at least on a continuum compared to us cold-hearted northern types, it's generally true. Um, it's not so much that the emotions are out of control, but the emotions are kept on a longer leash than we do. And you know, people are more likely to sort of turn on a dime when it comes to their feelings. This surprises people and, and confuses people that aren't used to that kind of intuitive thinking. But it's, you know, I would say it's every bit as common on the planet as the more rational, sort of methodical, linear kind of thinking. Um, in many ways, it's a more human way of thinking because it acknowledges the fact that humans are contradictory and a little bit crazy. <clears throat> Um, another example of that was, um, I was watching a long time ago, the world at war about the fall of Berlin when the Russian army, the red army swept into Berlin after four years of the most apocalyptic hellish war in human history, 40 million dead, the Holocaust, all this stuff, just the worst things imaginable happened that the German army and the SS and everybody had basically raped every inch of Russian soil that they'd occupied. Uh, they'd raped their way through Russia and murdered everybody that fell into their hands. And it was just the most atrocity ridden war. So now the Russians are coming through Berlin. It's payback time. And, you know, I think we all know of the mass rapes that took place in Eastern Germany in the second world war. Um, and this one guy in Berlin, um, was, uh, he was a married man and he was, uh, he was in Berlin and his wife had been killed. I think this is the story. And a bunch of Russian soldiers were going from house to house. They only knew the word Frau, women. We want women. We want to rape women. And, <clears throat> you know, can you imagine the circumstances like, that you went through this period that, you were in a, in a defeated city and an army was going through there bent on literally rape and pillage. Uh, not rape and pillage in the sense that it's come down to us, i.e. just acting badly, but actual rape and actual pillage. Um, Stalin even encouraged his men to do that. So, you know, these drunken Russian soldiers are scouring the neighborhood for as many women as they can find. They're going to gang rape them, maybe shoot them, maybe not, you know, whatever. Uh, these guys have been brutalized by four years of frontline warfare, the most ferocious war in human history. 
<coughs> so anyway, this Russian soldier with his submachine gun finds this guy. He goes, Frau, Frau, Frau. He's like, give me, show me your women, show me your women. You know, and just obviously he wants to rape them. So the, the German guy goes, okay, here, Frau, Frau, come with me, come with me. And he walks over. He goes, there's my Frau. And of course it was her grave in the backyard. Um, they, you know, just buried her on the spot. Um, there's my Frau. You want my Frau? There she is. And the Russian immediately switched. His heart kind of in that second, as the German explains it, kind of melted. And he went, oh, she's dead. Oh, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. And he sort of patted him on the shoulder. I'm sorry that you lost your wife and took off, possibly to go and rape another woman. Um, how do you fit that into the overall narrative? And this German guy in was explaining this 30 years after it happened. And he was still saying, I was touched by this. How does this make any sense at all? Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't fit in that this Russian should have reacted this way. First, he wants to rape my wife. He finds out he's, that she's dead. And he's saddened by this and he feels sorry for me. This doesn't make sense. But again, the emotions. Do the emotions make sense? You know, um, you could say that, say, uh, an Allied soldier who discovered the concentration camps back in Toronto or wherever he was from, he might have been an anti-Semite. He might have thought, I can't stand those damn Jews. You know, I wish they'd get out of my face and, you know, probably even express those opinions, you know, possibly. But then he sees concentration camp and it's like, oh my God. Okay, I, I, sure, I hate Jews just as much as anybody, but with this, are you, what? I just don't want them in my neighborhood. I, I don't want, what? You know, there are degrees of, you know, or there, are, sometimes there are balances within people's characters that may look like paradoxes, but they're not. It's just that human beings aren't simple. We don't have one fundamental nature. Um, we have many natures. One of them might be dominant at a particular time, like the Russian guy who wanted to rape the Frau. Um, suddenly, just because he, he just switched his perspective right then and there, he went, oh, this poor guy lived long enough to bury his wife. <sighs> All right, I, yeah, this, this isn't for me. I, I want, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to leave this guy to his mourning and... You know, this isn't, this isn't the place for atrocities. Over there might be, but not here. <clears throat> it's the same thing, right? The, the guy might, you know, it's like a redneck from wherever who dislikes black people back in the 1960s and, you know, even might, might use the N-word or whatever. And he'd probably have a fit if his daughter decided that she was going to date a black guy or something like that. And, you know, but lynch people? even like making people nervous or terrorizing. Why? No, I don't want to do any of that. You know, it's, you sort of think that if a guy is a racist, he's a one dimensional character, but I don't think so. And the, the people that are sort of more self-reflective and, and who examine themselves more will actually notice this in themselves. You're, you're actually more honest. You will see that you are a contradictory person, that you have, there's no one nature in there. And one might struggle to the forefront for a while, but it's not going to stay there forever. We're going to slip back into this, that, or the other. We're, you know, because, again, you can never really fundamentally alter um, or expunge certain aspects of, of who you are. It will always come out under certain circumstances. Like I said, with, um, with Neo-Skeptic, if you were pushed to it, if you were an extremist, you could become Heinrich Himmler. Yes, I could. I'm not going to deny that. But I'm not an extremist right now, right? So which is which? You know, which is the real me? Maybe they both are. Maybe circumstances bring out the bad me. 
Um, and also circumstances bring out the good me. Isn't it easy to be good when you're inside in a nice warm house and you've got a fridge full of uh, food and, <clears throat> you know, you got a cat sleeping over there and, you know, you feel good about the world. Oh, yeah, I think I'll make myself a nice cup of coffee. You know, this, like, oh, yeah, it, it's very easy for me to be, you know, a good person right now. But put me in certain horrible circumstances and I'm just as capable of being bad as anybody else. Yes, that's true. But which is the real me? Both? I would say both are. Um... And I think that acknowledging that is a pretty sure way of making sure that the truly negative or the phony good doesn't come out. When you try to be a good person all the time, you result, it, it, it results in so much lying, if you ask me, uh, to yourself, because sometimes you want to throttle that bastard, whoever that person is, you know. Uh, not a good thought. I shouldn't think like this. I want to be a good person. I still have thoughts like this. I wish those damn thoughts would go away. They're not going away. Now what do I do? Well, I, can, I fight myself for all eternity, even though I know I can't destroy the dark side in me. It just keeps coming out, no matter what I do. And if I, if I try and expunge the dark side from my character, it'll come out subconsciously or sublogically. Or I'll justify it. I'll say that my wrathful impulses are completely justified because... Certain people are just bad, and they, they have it coming. Anyone is disgusted by the sight of a bad person, right? So that's why when I have horrible thoughts, it's just because I've been driven to it by the evils of other people. All these sort of little deals with your own fundamental nature can take place all the time when you're trying to look at things in a binary way. Um, as I say, you can, you can spin good acts as totally selfish, unaltruistic, egocentric acts, greedy, selfish things. You can spin the bad stuff exactly the same way, and you can point out crazy inconsistencies in human behavior. Um, you know, Adolf Hitler apparently loved little children. He truly did. You know, everyone who met him said that he thought kids were wonderful, and he loved animals. He was a vegetarian. He hated cruelty to animals. He's perfectly willing to send six million people to the gas chambers, but he didn't like somebody beating his dog. I, I, where, do, where does all this fit in? How does, how does this, how, how do you establish the, you know, this, the moral worth of this person? I don't think you even need to establish the moral worth of Adolf Hitler to fight and kill him. Um, it's just, okay, he's, he's messing the world up here. He's screwing everything up. Um, look what he's doing. Um, you know, th there's any number of reasons why you could oppose Nazism and everything like that without believing that it's evil. Uh, try and make the case that it isn't evil, and you're, well, you're going to get attacked and denounced, right? I'm not going to do that, you know, just for sort of, a, for the sake of argument. That was the ritual animal slaughter thing that I was talking about before, like I'm edging towards that. But even I don't want to go whole hog and say that you can spin Nazism into something great. <coughs> because remember, I'm not just trying to disprove that there are evil people in the world. I'm saying I, I'm not convinced that there are, and I'm saying that we may not be able to tell whether or not somebody is fundamentally evil. But again, we don't need to believe that they're evil to kill them or lock them up. Likewise, I don't believe that anybody is fundamentally good, A, because, again, you can fake it. You can fake it to yourself. Um, and ultimately, I can only look at what somebody does and listen to what they say. I can never really read what their motives are. I can't. I don't know why anybody would do a good act, and I don't know what their motivation for doing it is. Somebody does something that looks pretty darn good. I still don't know if that person is good. As I say, you, you want to put a negative spin on it, any good act, you can do it. Go for it. Try it. It works. You can spin everything into shit. You can drag everything down and make it look horrible. Um, any good act, any act of altruism, kindness, love, all of that. If you set your mind to it, you can demonstrate that it's all just garbage, that 
all the good out there is actually totally egocentric. Okay, can't you do that with all the evil out there as well? Why not? 